I were to be honest with you, this week, these past few weeks have been really, really rough. Um, and so like, I, preparing this message was really a big struggle for myself. Um, and we, it's my daughter's fourth birthday today, so we've been spin, we had a big party yesterday, so I'm just kind of like very tired. And I was like, man, I don't know if I want to preach this morning. And then I woke up this morning and went to go get, I was trying to find my keys, trying to find them for about 20 minutes, uh, found them. But when I went outside to go make sure I didn't lock them in my car, I found our hibiscus plant. Am I saying that right? Okay, I, that's one word I can't say that, that well. But I didn't know they actually had flowers and I'm just, I'm just impressed that it's still alive. Uh, but I walked out this morning and I f saw that there's like, these two flowers that were just like in full bloom and I'm like, man, God is so cool with just like the nature and just like how beautiful everything is. I'm like, why am I letting these like small things really weigh down my heart? and really just kind of just like destroy my courage to actually preach this morning. And so I'm sharing that at a moment of like weakness. Like I feel very tired emotionally, spiritually, even physically, but like, please pray for us as leaders. Please pray for people within your church, within your community group. If you're not in a community group, get plugged into a community group. We have connect cards for you to do that. And that's kind of where like this entire message is kind of rooting from is that it's, it's like, it's like the sermon title is called like a burdened heart and it's being like, what is tugging at your heart? So maybe you're kind of in a similar, similar situation where you kind of feel stuck right now. You feel like you're in a rut and you know, you need to get out of this rut, but you don't know how you're going to do this. Uh, I remember a few years ago when I was probably uh, more than a few years ago, I'm getting older now. This is probably when I was in grade three. So this is like, <laughs> it's a few years ago. Um, my grandfather and myself uh, went out to go watch the Maple Leafs play. I uh, don't remember the score, I'm, I'm assuming they probably lost. But while we were in the parkade after the game, we parked right around the rink, uh, and my, my grandfather's GPS had this really unnecessarily annoying future on it, which allows you to simulate the drive while you're not moving at all. Unknowns to my grandfather, he hit this button and it said go. By the time we got out of the parkade, the GPS was already on the 401. And so we drove for 40 minutes straight downtown Toronto. And the entire time I'm like, Grandpa, like this is, this is not the right way. There's not even any like lights on this. It's saying we're, we're, we're near Milton. Like we're not, we're in Toronto still. And I got to that moment where he's like, we are very, very lost. And his GPS stopped working at that point. And so, after that, and one police stop later, because we got pulled over on the highway for whatever reason, um, we got home at about two o'clock in the morning, and my mom was weeping. And uh, yeah, I never want to go watch a hockey game with my grandfather ever again. Uh, I don't know why. But this is the reality though, is that sometimes we do make it to our destination, but it becomes this really bumpy and weird and confusing path. My mic just cut out. Testing, okay, here we go. Okay, so sometimes like my grandfather, we find ourselves in these situations where we seem to get messier the more we try to navigate it, but there's a better way to how we can actually approach these situations. It's not just one of navigating, but one of actually transforming our journey. So today we're gonna to be looking at Nehemiah who offers valuable insights to how we can actually get out of those moments where we feel stuck or we feel burdened and how we can actually explore them through the lens of Christ. So through a combination of prayer, planning, and action to address these massive issues that are in our life that we have really struggled with, his story provides us an example of how to turn our burdens into action. So I'm gonna read, uh, Matt, the, the, the scriptures are on the slides here. So it goes Nehemiah 2, if you wanna turn there, if you have a physical Bible, uh, we're just gonna be reading verses one through nine. I'll be reading through the NLT translation, but again, Whatever translation works for you, works for you. Okay, so in the month of Nisan, in the 20th, king, 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine, this is, I, this is Nehemiah speaking, and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before, so the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you're not ill? There can be nothing but sadness of the heart. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, my king, live forever. Why should my face not look so sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, what is it that you want? 
Then I, then I prayed to the God of heaven, and I answered the king, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city of Judah, where my ancestors are buried, so that I can rebuild it. Then the king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked me, How long will your journey take, and when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. I also said to him, If it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of the trans Euphrates, so that it will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. May I have a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the royal park, so that he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for the res residence that I will occupy. And because the gracious hand of God was on me, the king granted my requests. So I went to the governors of the trans Euphrates and gave them the king's letter. The king had also sent off army officers and cavalry with me. Let's just do a quick prayer. God, we thank you so much just for the scripture and just for your divine word and how they can speak volumes to us today. These small stories share a big aspect of who you are and it shares your heart and your desire for us, God. And so we just give thanks for everything that you're doing us and may you just give us an ear to hear uh, for your message today. We pray this all in your name. Amen. So this might feel like I kind of just dropped you in the middle of a story and you're kind of confused as to what's going on. Uh, I was at my daughter's birthday party yesterday. I was talking with somebody and that they were watching a movie and we we're talking about like, oh, Blockbuster and how amazing that was. And the movie was so long that there's two discs. So there's like disc one and disc two. Uh, they unknowingly put disc two in without realizing that you need to watch disc one. And so they kind of got dropped in halfway through, like what is going on? And then they realized, oh, we put in the wrong DVD. I kind of feel like that's what's happening here. So I want to actually give you guys some background. And so if you go to the side, it says, like, how do we even get here? So we can see that God actually promised Abraham that he would give him and his offspring the, the land of Canaan for their everlasting possession. So after about 400 years in Egypt, the people of Israel journeyed for 40 years through the desert until they reached the promised land. And this was led by Joshua as when they entered in. They conquered the land west of Jordan and devoted the cities of the Canaanites to destruction. And at the end of Joshua's life, he could tell that not one word has failed of all the good things that the Lord your God has promised us concerning to you. All that you have come to pass is for you, and not one of them has failed. However, about six centuries later, the capital cities of Samaria and Jerusalem were destroyed. The land of Israel was ruined, and the upper class of society was led captive to the east, to Babylon. And why is this? Well, the, the answer is sin. We read that the promise of the Israelites concerning the land was not unconditional. It was actually dependent on the obedience to God's law. Moses states, as it follows in Deuteronomy 28, 50, 58 to 64, it's a clear warning to us that we need to follow God's commands or else there is unfortunately going to be consequences. See, if you do not carefully follow all the words of this law, which are written in this book, and do not revere this glorious and awesome name, the Lord your God, the Lord will send fearful plagues on you and your descendants, harsh and prolonged disasters, and a severe and lingering illnesses. Just as it pleased the Lord to make you prosper and to increase in number, so it will please him to ruin and destroy you. You will be uprooted from your land and from the land that you are entering to possess. Then the Lord will scatter you among all nations from one end of the earth to the other. It's pretty clear as to what is being said in Deuteronomy here. And we can see time and time again throughout the Old Testament, throughout the Bible, even today, that we live in this cycle. As early as the time of Judges, it all went wrong. People worshipped idols and committed all types of terrible sins. For almost two centuries, the vast majority of people sinned grievously against the Lord and their neighbors, despite the continuous pleas and cries from the prophets. See, God was punishing them to bring them to conversion, but it was in vain because they continued to stick in their ways. They were stuck in their old paths and their old traditions of trying to honor themselves. So this leads us to our first point. For those that like having like the three points, the three points are going to be prayer, plan, and participate. So if you, if you like doing that, my apologies for not sending any notes in advance, but those are the three points that we're going to have. So we need to pray. We need to know what our why is. And it's clear that Nehemiah's life from the very get-go is very direct with his prayers. He knows what he is praying for. 
When I was younger, I had a, my second mom, Suzanne, uh, went to a conference and she bought me this t-shirt. I think I was in grade 10 or grade 11 at this point. And this t-shirt, I had the lines, here I am God, send that guy. And I was like, oh, Suzanne, I don't know if you got me the right shirt. I'm pretty sure this is for like someone who's like, I'm single and ready to mingle, like send me a guy. But then she's like, no, you're an idiot. Like, it's actually talking about people who say like, yeah, I'm ready to serve, but as soon as you're given the opportunity to serve, you're like, ah, but send that person and said, I don't want to do that. And I laugh, but I also really cringe because I had that serious issue. I thought that to do something meaningful, I would have to have this like burning bush moment or like a giant fish would have to come and swallow me up or have like a literal encounter with Jesus as like what Paul did. But when we look at Nehemiah's story, we don't see any of that taking place. But what happens is that he discovers what his why is. So we need to learn what our why is. So we can see that we need to have our burdens over our burning bush. And so what this means is like we need to actually allow our heart to be moved to action rather than just waiting for a really cool moment to happen where we start to act. Again, verse 2 says, So the king asked me, Why does your face look so sad when you're not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of the heart. Nehemiah's response was very human. It was, he was very afraid, but I said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Again, Nehemiah's not waiting for this burning bush moment. Instead, what he's actually looking for, he's allowing his heart to be moved to act by God. God is stirring something in his heart. And he started to pay attention to what his heart was actually saying. Nehemiah's burdens are what motivated his prayers. It's what motivated his thoughts, his plans, and he even physically moved him. I don't know about you, but I'm somebody that uh, has a really hard time hiding their emotions on their face. So you can pretty much tell what I'm thinking, uh, for sometimes for better or for worse, usually it ends up being for worse. But this is one of those moments where Nehemiah is so distraught that he cannot help but show his anguish that he is feeling. He was so burdened by this news that he prayed and fasted for four months. And it took four months for the king to actually notice him. Maybe you can think of a time to kind of make this more home of like, when you're talking to somebody, you can just see their body language and they're like, oh, they are totally not paying attention to me. Or like, man, I'm not going to go near them because they look pretty mad. This is kind of what's going on here. And you can go to the next slide. Is that our prayers lead us into action. You see, because his burden actually built his ministry. Um, I had a, had a mentor uh, who was a lovely person but has some like, really annoying antics. Like whenever you come to a, with him with a problem, he gets really excited. Like, man, uh, I'll use an example. Like, man, my, uh, Catherine and I broke up. He's like, ha ha, you're getting a story. This is great news. And I'm like, no, I am, I am feeling hurt. Like, this sucks. But he's like, no, these things here are gonna allow you to have moments of connection and moments of peace with other people when they're going through their trials. I'm like, yeah, that's great for later, but what about me now? But it's a true thing, though, is that when we do go through these moments, there are these silver lining moments where you can actually use that to glorify God. So this is one of those things where he's getting a story because of the burdens that he's experiencing. If you go to the next slide, you can see that he was, I mentioned that he was burdened for four months. So Nehemiah, in the month of Chislev, while in the citadel of Susa, received a report from a distress of the Jewish remnant in Jerusalem. And his response was immediate. So this is, this is referring back to Nehemiah 1. It says, For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Although the exact duration is not specified here, it's just the context for Nehemiah's um, extended period of prayer. Nehemiah 2 verse 1, it says, In the month of Nisan, which is four months after Chislev, Nehemiah was in the presence of the king. Artaxerxes. Uh, so this verse implies that Nehemiah has been praying and fasting for four months before approaching the king with his request. See, Nehemiah was actually establishing his roots. He was planting the seed that was in his heart and he was nurturing it through prayer. To further solidify that Nehemiah needed to nurture the seed of burden, even before he shared it with the king, 
he quickly prayed for himself. Verse 4, it says, Then I pray to the God of heaven, and I answer the king. And I kind of wonder, like, I wonder what that actually looks like. Does that mean, like, while Nehemiah was talking to the king, he said, uh, Hold up, Artur- Artur- I need to pray, give me one second. Or is it one of those things where he just kind of closed his eyes and just quiet his heart and just did a quick prayer? Regardless of which one it is, it speaks to the volumes of what he's actually going to do. Uh, reading many commentaries on this book, I came across one that mentions that for four months, Nehemiah was, was praying to prepare the message, but in verse 4, his prayer was different. As he was actually preparing himself as the messenger for the message. So you need, might need to ensure that this was actually the right moment, the right time, the right message to deliver to the king. And who better to ask than for God? See, in our own lives, we may feel a burden or a call to action, and sometimes we're just too quick to act, but we need to actually seek God in prayer. Nehemiah's example teaches us that if we move before prayer, it's going to like destroy everything. But if we do spend time with God, if we do spend time seeking his guidance and his, ti- his timing, things will work out okay. So we need to nurture the burden, we need to prepare the message by praying, and we also need to prepare ourselves as the messenger. And most importantly, we need to seek God's timing. And truthfully, this is always going to be the hardest thing to do. Nehemiah's patiently waiting and persistent prayer demonstrates the importance of God's timing. He waited until the right moment to present his request to the king, guided by God's perfect timing. I kind of liken this to like the anxiety of like planning a proposal for like an engagement, being like, oh man, like what's the right time to do this? And the reality is like you can kind of just do it whenever, but there's a lot of pressure to do it. I took Catherine on like a sunrise hike at like four o'clock in the morning. Was that the right time? I don't know, but I had a great nap afterwards and she said yes, so praise God. But like we need to actually ask God, like how am I doing? Am I actually obeying and being obedient to the timing of what you're asking for? So that leads us to actually our prayers. So our prayers, we need to know our why, but then it leads us into planning. So we need to actually gather the resources. So again, for four months, Nehemiah prayed and planned. I heard a pastor once share that prayer and planning are similar to taking footsteps. You need both to move forward. Planning without prayer is, is, is almost trying to like do a marathon without any training, and this is not going to work well with you. You're going to be throwing up. You're going to be a hot mess. This is going to be gross. So without prayer, our plans will fall flat because it misses the crucial guidance and support that only prayer can actually bring. See, Nehemiah's story highlights this per- perfectly. He prayed and planned with intention, and because of that, the results were amazing. And in Nehemiah 2, verse 8, it says, Because the gracious hand of my God was on me. It's only because of the gracious, God, uh, the gracious hand of God that the king himself was moved. The king granted his request. This shows to us that success, his success wasn't about the plan that was made, but also about the prayers he prayed. You see, if you're solely focusing only on planning and leaving prayer out, or even worse, you're planning and then praying that your, your plans work out, it's just not going to go well. It's time for us to actually rethink our approach. Adding prayer to your planning isn't just a good idea. It's needed and it's essential. It's how you make sure your efforts are blessed and guided by divine wisdom, leading to better outcomes and fewer obstacles. You can go to the next slide. So if you're simply just planning right now and not praying, we need to kind of change our hearts with that. I'm, I'm very guilty of this also for myself. And we need to have a bold faith. See, fear is a large reason why we need to be rooted in prayer. Here in Canada, uh, being a Christian isn't that much of a risk in comparison to other world areas. What Nehemiah is about to do is a cultural massive no-no. That's why he's afraid. Fear is a natural reaction, but God doesn't want our fear to allow us to control us. You can go to the next slide. 
So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. You need to cast all anxiety on him because he cares for you. See, we must move past our fear in order to do what God wants us to do. What are some things that you might be afraid of to doing? What are some things you're nervous about? But you need to do them anyways. Because again, when you look at the status of a king versus a cupbearer, they're completely different levels. We can't let fear be the thing that holds us up. And that's why we need to have prayer. But also, through prayer and through our planning, we need to be able to cast a vision. See, Nehemiah is a very, very smart man, much smarter than me. And, but after all, though, he is a cupbearer, and so he most likely would have sat in on some very important meetings by the king's side. He would have seen how the king led. And, but regardless of this, though, Nehemiah knew how to cast a vision. He knew how to get people aboard on his plan. In verse 5, he gives the king his authority by acknowledging him, and he gives a clear and direct message. And lastly, he gives a reason for his mission. He didn't just simply say, I want to go there just to rebuild the walls. He gives a vision that's not a way of guilting people into doing something, but in order for them to actually partner with them. He allows them to partner with them rather than guilt them. We can use this in things that we do here. Vision is not a tool to tell people they, they have to do this. It's something that allows them to motivate their heart, to change their heart, to come alongside of you. Adam Stanley, this is on the slide also, and his book, Visioneering, uh, follows Nehemiah's life. It's actually a fantastic book for, for this purpose. And he shares that vision translates into purpose. A vision gives you a reason to get up in the morning. If you do not show up, something important won't be accomplished. Suddenly, you matter. You matter a lot. Without you, what could be and what should be won't be. A vision makes you an important link between current reality in the future. I just want to repeat one thing quite a bit. It's like you matter a lot. Again, without you, what could be and what should be won't be. There's a, there's a response that we need to have as followers of Christ. We need to be able to cast a vision when we've been motivated into prayer. So here in church, Sometimes we look at our volunteer teams, our ministry teams, and we just be like, we need more people because we need more people. And nobody's like, yes, I want to be a part of that. But what if we were to change the language that we use? What if we look at those that are looking to volunteer? We need volunteers for kids ministry right now. Be like, not only if, if you say yes to volunteer here, you are raising young believers in Christ, but not only that, parents will get to meet with Jesus because you said yes to serve because they're not chasing their kids around. And all the parents said amen because we've experienced that at St. Gabe's for quite some time. But for greeters, you can be like, somebody will find safety in your smile because you greeted them as they entered into the church. Or for the church creatives, those running the slideshows, those running our social media, being like, because of you, we can actually follow along and learn what is being taught to us. We can actually sing together as a family because you're clicking a button. It's not just clicking a button. We're allowing people to enter into a place where they can worship God. There are so many more examples that we can do, but our language needs to be important. We need to be able to cast a vision so they can give purpose behind our actions. So to the final point, we need to be able to participate. So what's your role? You need to serve where you are. See, our Bibles today have the books Ezra and Nehemiah separated, but that wasn't always the case. That's because these two stories are incredibly intertwined. So far in this chapter, we've read about two characters. We've read about Nehemiah and the king. However, there are two more important characters that we need to know about to kind of get some further context of this. Uh, Zerubbabel was called to build the temple and Ezra to establish the Torah and community of Jerusalem. So you have a prophet and a priest. And I know there's some students here that go to HDCH. Uh, the, the, the Bible teacher there has this really cheesy saying, but it, it helps, is that Zerubbabel, you can remember him because everything was in rubbles. 
And you can remember Nehemiah because when he built the wall, it was a kind of like knee high before everything kind of like started like hitting the fan and he started to like, had to like protect it. So Zerubbabel, rebels, Nehemiah, knee high. Uh, and then for uh, Ezra, it's just, just Ezra. There's, there's nothing for Ezra, unfortunately. <laughs> But again, you have a prophet and a priest, but when we look at Nehemiah, we see a slave who became a cupbearer. Now, for those that are super confused, me like, what in the world is a cupbearer? And this is something that you probably would never do post-COVID, but a cupbearer would literally would drink from the cup to make sure it's not poisoned and make sure you're not gonna die. So as a result, if you drink it and you don't die, the king can drink it and he can live. It's, pretty, it's a pretty great role. Who wants to sign up for that? Being like, yeah, I, I want to play Russian roulette with a cup. Like, sign me up. See, cup bearers are dispensable. However, they are critical to the safety of the king. You need to be trustworthy and need to be morally righteous. See, that's how Nehemiah was called into this place. That's why he was able to advance all the way up to this position. I don't know about you, but if I was the king, I would not want to have a liar or someone who's not trustworthy drinking from my cup and be like, it's good. I've watched Emperor's New Group a lot growing up. And for those that are my age can get that reference and those that aren't, sorry. But that's the thing though, is that Nehemiah's character is what the king sought after. So how is God calling you to serve? And how are we actually faithfully doing that? How is our character being shown in all of our actions? I shared before that we have these, these seven, the seven spheres of influence. You have your family, you have the church, you have religion, you have education, government, media, celebration, and economics. Every single job that's imaginable fits underneath one of these categories. So my question to you is how are you occupying your space? Do people even know that you're a follower of Christ? Uh, I love my mom's, I love my mom, period. But I love my mom's story. My mom has a very rough upbringing. Uh, my mom was involved in a lot of gang activities when she was younger. Uh, and so depending on what you met your, my mom, like you would have like some very different uh, pictures of what my mom looks like. My mom became a Christian when I was born. That's why I'm the favorite. Um, but... Now my mom is the someone who's just on fire for God. And when she goes out into the community, people often stop her. This is like a stall bomb trait. It's really, maybe it's just a Cambridge thing because it hasn't really happened here in Brantford or maybe I'm doing a bad job. I don't know which one it is. But people would stop my mom and be like, something is different about you. My mom's like, hi, I'm Mark. Who, who are you? And there's something about the way she carries herself that distinguishes her and separates her from other people. Are we living a life that people can actually point to us and be like, yes, like they're a Christian. I have another mentor of mine that lives out in the Calgary who is a pastor and his wife is embarrassed to admit that she's married to a pastor because it kills all conversations because Christians have a really bad rep for not loving well and not actually embodying Christ's love well to others. So how can we change that? As we continue on with the story, though, one of my profs uh, loves to really challenge the narrative of how we read the Bible. He wants us to ask ourselves constantly, who else is in this story? Who else sees God? How else can we view God through the lens of somebody else that's not the main character? So what about the king? You see, some of us are like the king. We have material wealth. We have status. We have items that we cling to and we hold steadfast and we can't give those up to anybody else. Ask yourselves, if, if you were the king in this story or the queen, would you act in the same way? Can we think about how awkward and how unique this is that the king actually takes the time to acknowledge his cupbearer and the feelings that he's bringing? Again, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of the heart. Artaxerxes acknowledges them, those around him. He asks them, and not only pointing, he's just asking to make himself feel good. He actually listens. And then he does the unthinkable. 
He asks, what is it that you want? Maybe you have some people in your life uh, that I know I do, where you, whenever you go to them with a moment or like a struggle, all of a sudden you kind of feel like you're a problem that they're trying to fix and they're just trying to give you advice. You're like, I'm not asking for advice. I'm just wanting to share my burdens with you. The king did not do that. The king's actually asking, how can I partner alongside you? Again, how long will your journey take? When will you get back? It would be much easier and make way more sense. If I was king, I would probably be doing this. Again, everybody should be really happy I'm not a king. But like the king would have every right to say, you know what, I'll give you one month to figure this all out and you have at or have fun, uh, but you're on your own. The king would have every right to do this. Maybe you can, if, you're, if this isn't relating to you, maybe you can think back to like times where you've had different jobs and different bosses and different people of authority over top of you, and they just have some really unrealistic expectations for you. Again, the king has every right to have this sort of uh, mindset to have, but again, he doesn't. So here's the, some of the sad news, though, that many of us are going to struggle with, is that when we become a Christian, when we, we, just, we just celebrate in these baptisms, but becoming a follower of Christ doesn't mean it's going to be easy. It's not this golden ticket to get out of all your problems. I wish it was at times, but it's actually quite the opposite. You see, when we serve and when we pursue God, uh, to pursue God what, what He wants in our lives, it's not going to be easy. And at times, it's going to cost us. Sometimes it's wealth, sometimes it's our desires, and other times it can just be our comfort. And here, again, the king has a costly decision. Nehemiah asks for quite a bit. So in modern words, in modern times, like he's essentially asking for visas to travel to Judah. He's asking for an entourage for protection. He's asking for timber from the king's yard himself, the royal park. He's asking for like the king's stuff. Again, we're talking about a cupbearer, not somebody of equal status. Maybe you're like me, and you want to only serve when it's only convenient for you. I believe that that might have been a part of the reason why uh, Suzanne, like my second mom, bought me that shirt all those years ago. It's because some of us actually need to be acting like the king in this situation. You're in an environment where you're called to give to somebody, or maybe you're called to be the one aiding somebody. Who's the Nehemiah in your life? Again, what burdens is God placing on your heart? You can go to the last slide. Uh, so it says change of heart. Again, we need to, we can look to the king and be like, wow, Artaxerxes is a great person. He's a good king. Uh, he wasn't. The king was corrupt. And you want to know how he got into power? He got into power because he killed his own brother. Again, if you were to ex examine a historical text from this timeline, from this from different sources, you would see this. Artaxerxes was the youngest of three brothers. When his father, who was the king, died, Artaxerxes killed the eldest son, Darius, and he took his place as king. Throughout his reign, he faced multiple challenges of widespread unrest and revolts throughout the province. In Ezra 23, verse 24, uh, Artaxerxes actually stops Zerubbabel from building the temple because he was worried about a Jewish rebellion but yet God still used him. The same king that led Ezra into Jerusalem, the king had granted him everything that he asked for, for the hand of the Lord, of, of his God, was on him. So again, we see the exact same words in Ezra 7, is that the hand of the Lord was on Ezra. And this is the thing. People respond to God's movement. And again, Artaxerxes is the same king that let Nehemiah go. Maybe it's time that we actually examine our own hearts. Have we hardened our hearts towards anything? Is there anything that we are like, nope, God, I'm not moving in that way. I'm not doing that. But there's hope, though. See, Nehemiah's relationship with Artaxerxes was largely a one-way relationship. Nehemiah is risking everything for the king as a cupbearer. Artaxerxes has no real reason to grant Nehemiah's wishes and demands 
Nehemiah isn't going to build these walls in Jerusalem for the lowercase king. He's not building these things for Artaxerxes. He's building them for the true king. He's building them to glorify and bring honor to God. If Artaxerxes, a pagan king, can have a heart for Nehemiah's request, this offers us, this offers us great hope. It's like how much more can God do through us because of the heart that we have to serve for him? And all this is for nothing if it wasn't for Jesus. Again, Jesus is the example. Jesus is the better Nehemiah. Nehemiah's purpose was to rebuild Jerusalem's walls and restore its spiritual life. He felt a deep calling from God to fulfill this mission, beginning with prayer and fasting and seeking God's guidance and favor. Jesus, too, had a very clear mission from the beginning, to redeem humanity through his sacrificial death and resurrection. His life was marked by constant prayer and a strategic plan to spread the good news and establish God's kingdom here on earth. Both Nehemiah and Jesus faced significant opposition. Nehemiah endured, ridiculed, endured being ridiculed and being threatened to the point where they were literally building the wall with like one hammer in one hand and a sword in the other. Like this is the intent of like the spiritual battle that some of us are going to be facing. And again, Jesus faced the ultimate sacrifice in his own actions, his own life for our redemption. See, the baptism that we are celebrating today is a powerful reminder of the transformative journey that we are called to embrace. Nehemiah's and Jesus' mission were both marked by a deep commitment and sacrifice. And this baptism tank isn't just something that's a small meaning. It represents our own commitment to follow Christ and to publicly declare our faith. May it serve a reminder for ourselves for those that have been baptized, how does this edify us? How does this build us up? What does it remind us of what we need to be doing? What are the burdens that God has placed in our hearts? Are there challenges or callings that seem too great for us to handle alone? How can you partner with somebody else? And the biggest question that I want to ask is, how are you doing with your own faith? Uh, growing up, we had, we had a door in our house that we would mark the height of how, how much we've grown year to year. I'm the youngest of six kids, so I was the overachiever, and I measured myself every day, and I was very disappointed whenever I didn't see any growth. <laughs> but when I was preparing this message, this image of that door came back to me, and, and it was God asking me, like, are you still doing the same thing with your faith? Are you still doing check-ins to be like, am I still growing? And the question is for you, it's that same thing. Are we actually progressing in our faith? Are we just content are we, and we just become stagnant? Have we plateaued in our faith? Are we continuing to allow God to stir our hearts so that we can continue to grow? So again, we need to embrace our burdens. We need to pray with purpose. And through that, we can plan and act we need to face opposition with bold faith. We can do all of this is because we know what Christ has done for us. So as we prepare our hearts to enter into like the song of worship, I want you to ask yourselves, how is God calling you to serve? It could be tangible, and there's very practical needs here within the church, truthfully. We need help in almost every single ministry. I don't think there's any ministry right now that being like, yep. We don't need any more volunteers. We don't, we don't need anybody to partner with us. Because if that's the case, we have fallen short. There are ways of how you can partner with the church. But even more important, there's ways of how you can partner within your own community, within your own work. So again, what steps can we take to turn the burdens of our hearts into blessings for others? I'll ask the worship team to come on up and I'll pray uh, just for us all today. God, we just thank you so much for the message of Nehemiah. We thank you for the transformative work that you continue to do in our hearts and how our hearts can move mountains and how our hearts through your work, God, can allow for transformation to take place not only in our own life, God, but in the life of others. And we just give thanks, God. We just give thanks. May we be not become stagnant in our faith, God. May we not just be comfortable just sitting here on a Sunday morning just being filled, God, because it's, it's a blessing to be a blessing to other people, God. 
So may our actions not just be something that just is selfish, God. May our actions be something that glorifies your kingdom, God, and it edifies the body of Christ. And we just give thanks, God. We pray this all in your name. Amen.